a note for those of you watching or re-watching Hyoka alongside this analysis series. This video covers episodes 12 through 17. The festival arc is considered by many to be the highlight of Hyoka, so be sure to take your time and enjoy it. <sighs> All right, two months in the making. Let's do this. Hello and welcome to Replay Value. The Kanya Festival, the Jumanji Incident, and the final arc storyline. Hyoka's six-episode extravaganza is everything one could hope for and more. Home to some of the best Hyoka gifts, character moments, and side characters, well, I'm just excited to be here, frankly. And I'm sure you are too, given how I don't think a day has gone by in the last month without someone asking me when this video was going to go live. Well, today's the day, folks. A whopping one hour of Hyoka analysis and destroying the previous record for longest video on the channel. I know you're expecting great things from this video, and I hope not to disappoint, as we cover Hyoka's festival arc, The Weight of Great Expectations. Our arc begins with a fantastic look at the night before the festival begins. We start with this shot of the moon before cutting to a tracking shot, where we pull focus from a field to some purple flowers. These two shots place us in the rural area of town, which is confirmed once we join Chitanda walking. She solemnly asks if the others are asleep, as we cut to Mayaka's room, featuring another focus pull before we see the moonlight illuminating everything. Mayaka is restless, nervous about what tomorrow has in store for her as she looks at the calendar. We pan right across her bookshelves filled with manga volumes before our eyes are pulled in the opposite direction as she gets up and leaves the shot stage left. Our empty center is then filled, and something about the way this glass looks always strikes me no matter how many times I see it. Yet another focus pulled to the glass and the tablets before Mayaka settles a little bit, saying, tomorrow's the day. A brief cut back to Chitanda, who bridges the left-aligned framing of Mayaka to the right-aligned framing of Satoshi. Satoshi's lights are on as he flips through the guidebook excited for tomorrow. He and Mayaka are opposites in their outlook for the festival, shown not only through their emotions, but through the lighting of their scenes. As Satoshi flips through the booklet, he can't help but chuckle at his trick to place the Classics Club in an ideal position in the booklet, before foreshadowing some of the events he plans on joining over the course of the arc. Satoshi excitedly proclaims, tomorrow's the big day, as he looks up, and his eyeline naturally brings us back to Chitanda, who appears in that very spot. Hotro fills the empty space when we cut to him, checking out the festival website. It's some nice foreshadowing for later, and after Hotoro repeats Mayaka's words, just a bit more tired sounding as opposed to nervous, the same use of empty space brings us back from Hotoro to Chitanda, who is praying for much needed assistance over the next few days. We're reminded of the moon in this shot before Chitanda takes a deep breath and determinedly looks at the moon, a nice inverse of the shot that opened up the episode and sets up a closed loop. Not only does this opening do a nice job of setting up the emotional states for each of the characters, it also preps us for the way that the festival arc is structured. As opposed to the Sekitani Jun or movie mystery arc where there was only one goal that everyone was focused on and everyone was going about solving it in more or less the same way, allowing Hyoka to have Hotoro as the sole focal point for the audience to follow how these events transpired, the festival arc changes things up. Each of the characters gets some time in the spotlight as they go through their own ways to not only achieve the Classics Club's goal, but also their own personal matters, even if those goals are inevitably at odds with one another. This is the strength of the festival arc from a narrative perspective, allowing in particular Mayaka and Satoshi to shine as characters, and adding additional B-plot lines that can be brought up or resolved at key moments for pacing, which can then either be tied into the A-plot or remain isolated from it as necessary in terms of focus. Honestly, I might have to do a supplemental video looking purely at the structure in its totality because of how interesting it is. But for now, we'll continue to go through the episodes to see the effect of the structure in action. After the OP plays, we start festival day one at the Oreki residence. As Hotoro descends the stairs, Tomoe is visible on the right-hand side which provides the reference point for the next shot as Hotoro reaches the ground level. As Hotoro confirms Tomoe and the viewer's suspicions that there's trouble afoot for the Classics Club, we get this cute interaction between the two siblings that reaffirms their relationship. Tomoe, still ever enigmatic, throws Hotoro a broken pen in response to his retort about giving him something to fix the problem with. And while Hotoro heads out, Tomoe says she might visit, causing the little brother to protest. His face lines up nicely with the cut to the pink flower, which triggers a bunch of flags to the beginning of episode one. Not only is that pink color consistent, but the same music plays in the background, and sure enough, it's a walk to school. There are plenty of differences though, from the fact that Hotoro isn't alone and that he is far from the focal point being the main two. 
A multitude of shots in this sequence exist to downplay Hotoro and Satoshi. Even when we look from Hotoro's viewpoint, it takes him a second to place Mayaka. And this two shot is great. Satoshi was talking, so we were looking at him on the left, so when he finishes, it's natural to swap to the right, as the following shot uses the empty space to encourage us to look in that same direction. We get a brief glimpse of the two characters, they're the only ones wearing the black pants, before we jump back into their conversation. And to highlight the point I was making earlier about Hotoro no longer being the sole focus character, Satoshi and Mayaka's conversation goes out of its way to diminish Hotoro's screen presence. We cut from Hotoro's POV to Satoshi's, and this shot literally blocks 90% of Hotoro's body. We later get a cut back to reaffirm that Hotoro exists, something that's going to be happening a lot in the next three episodes in particular, but we mainly focus on Mayaka's cosplay- <laughs> Sorry, Mayaka's outfit and continue to allude to the Classics Club problem. Satoshi does his best to cheer her up. She's diminished in this frame, for example, but takes up the proper space in the following ones. And his excitement about the festival forces a smile on her face as they walk through the gate. Once inside, Satoshi and Mayaka stop to observe things, but Hotoro just plows right through, stating that it's too bright. And sure enough, as they make their way to the classroom, the amount of noise, signage, and people drop off significantly until there's basically nothing. Hotoro hints that more is bugging Mayaka than just whatever is up with the Classics Club as they enter the classroom. Hyoka is deliberately coy here. First, the show stays out in the hall for a few seconds longer than one would expect while it waits for Mayaka and Hotoro to make their way further into the room. When Hotoro places down his bag, we see a stack of copies of the anthology. As the camera pans right, we cut to Chitanda who's trying to get them hype. Everyone looks to the copies of the anthology with worry, as the audience thinks to themselves, Oh, I guess anthologies wouldn't be that popular. I guess that stack is pretty big. They'll have a hard time selling a few dozen. Mike even confirms that it's a numbers issue, as the camera work is designed to play up that specific stack. We even cut to the tea kettle just to avoid getting a proper look at the table. Hotoro then asks what everyone wants to know. <laughs> This scene always makes me laugh. After the camera refused to show us the inside of the classroom, we finally get to see the stacks piled high from three angles, just as Satoshi breaks even more tension by smacking his planet head into the ceiling. Chitanda doesn't even seem to realize what Satoshi is wearing until after Hotoro gives it a good push. With the blame for the copies being distributed evenly, making Mayaka feel better and giving us some good straight man humor from Hotoro, the Classics Club makes its plan to sell all 200 copies. The team establishes a need to attract customers through advertising and moving location. We briefly take another look at the brochure to establish executive committee president and Satoshi's ideal placement of the Classics Club before the plan is outlined. Chitanda is going to try and get a new booth, Satoshi is going to advertise by entering events under the Classics Club's name, and Hotoro, in an extremely self-satisfied moment, <laughs> After a quick reassessment of their plan and goal, Chitanda leads the team in a quick cheer as we cut to the opening ceremony. And credit where credit is due, this long shot between the president announcing the beginning of the festival and the dancers coming on feels super natural. And the surprise the characters feel is matched by the audience. The reaction shots of the Classics Club to the dancing is a total blast, especially as Chitanda fights between the urge to watch and to do her job. It's good foreshadowing for the following sequence of her getting trapped going through club activities because of her curiosity. The match cuts of her excited and disappointed are perfect for conveying time spent. When she finally reaches the the executive committee club room, we see the promotional poster for the festival, which is given just enough screen time to place it in our heads as relevant, but without overselling it. And we get to meet Tanabe, who is simultaneously unhelpful and very helpful at the same time, with Chitanda's negotiation skills leaving a bit to be desired, mostly because she jumps the gun on what she's asking for. Tanabe helps Chitanda lay out a new game plan to get other booths to let them sell Hyoka copies there, as we cut to Mayaka, who's about to enter Manga Society. She sighs right before before entering, puts on a brave face, and gives a cheerful good morning. The subtleties really sell this sequence for me. Not only the previous ones, which established that Mayaka clearly doesn't enjoy being there all too much, but then Kochi nitpicks Mayaka's shoes even after Mayaka gives her a compliment. They make the adversarial relationship feel genuine before we're even told about it later in the show. But the president is on Mayaka's side as she walks in, standing right beside Mayaka, causing her to instantly cheer up after the other girls ripped her. And Mayaka does have friends in the club as one of the girls runs over and gives her a brief hug, and a group begins talking about manga. We're able to both see 
why Mayaka was nervous about today, and why she's still in manga society despite that. And while manga society is picking up its first customers, the classics club is totally empty minus Hotoro and four huge piles of books. Hotoro heads to the window to take a listen to the acapella club's performance and overhears the first hint of our overarching mystery. Something missing and something about a card. And the plot train keeps rolling as the trading adventure also starts up in earnest. As the fashion club's punk character buys a copy of the anthology and trades a badge for the pen Hotoro got from Tomoe. And the acapella club singing transitions us on an auditory level from Hotoro to Chitanda, who has once again gotten distracted and continues to get distracted through a cute photo shoot and every Everything else as she goes through the hallway. Her spontaneous nature and the energy and the crowded classroom hallway is a bad combination as she looks to the camera asking if there's a way to see only just ahead. At the start of episode 13, we join up with Satoshi at the quiz show, though the only way you can tell is because of the giant Saturn on his head. And our resident database slash earthbound cosplayer kills the first question, with the classic opaque glasses giving way to a determined look. Using the quiz show audio as our bridge, we rejoin Manga Society, where things have slowed down a great deal. They've got no customers, and things are quiet enough where the members are playing along with the quiz show. But that's a brief stop, mainly to reestablish where Mayaka is with the new episode starting, before we rejoin Satoshi, who's made it into the finals, where he's joined by Tani. Tani is likely among the most disliked characters in the Hyoka community, but his role as foil to Satoshi is critical, not only in this arc, but also in later episodes, even though Tani's appearances are limited to just this festival. We'll be chatting about him a bit more after the quiz show ends. In the meantime, Satoshi begins his appeal to the audience for them to purchase a copy of Hyoka, and what a showman he is. Spinning around and ripping his glasses off, there's this fun moment where he gets so excited that the announcer gets tapped in the head with his rings. This is Satoshi in his element, when all eyes are on him and he's talking about something he's excited about. He's easily at the tens even if he's wearing a ridiculous costume. Hell, maybe even because of the costume. With tears in his eyes after a successful appeal, we cut back to Hotaro who's just chillin' in the club. Chitanda returns, and seemingly by the amount of stuff she's carrying, has been distracted by every club in the school. She half collapses from the exhaustion, even while reporting back to Hotaro, which again is a nice reminder for the audience of what happened in the last episode, before determining that she needs to go and help promote the club too, and heads off to the Wall Newspaper Club to ask them to write an article about the Classics Club. Togaito is about as helpful as he was in episode 3, but we're able to see another example of Chitanda not being clear on her initial action and leaving her conversation partner confused. Chitanda is now on a mission to find an interesting story, and this fun shot with the crystal ball is the lead into how she's going to find one. When Kahu says Eru, it's pretty surprising, since no one in the show refers to her by that name except for Kaho. I personally get a kick out of the fact that Chitanda tries to have a tarot reading, which kickstarts this mystery, given how tarot helped solve the last one. The fortune-telling club's Wheel of Fortune has been lost, is written on a card with Jumonji written on it which happens to be Kaho's family name, with the festival guide open to the last page. We also heard when Hotaro was listening to the acapella club that an apple juice had been taken, and that there was a card. But that's only if you were paying close attention. Depending on your level of close examination, there's either a pattern or this is a one-off incident, at least for now. With the mystery properly launched, we return to the quiz show, which features another example of Kyoto Annie's willingness to use a wide shot and just let the characters move around in it. It makes their close-ups a lot more impactful as a result, like this one when Satoshi doesn't know the name of the student council president, which in turn highlights that answer to the final question in the quiz show. As an alternate universe copy of Haikyuu's manager receives lavish praise, we cut to Tani and Satoshi talking in the aftermath. Tani suggests that they've come to a draw in this competition that he's drawn Satoshi into, which brings us to this close-up shot of his reaction. He's not happy about that at all. But it's only for a moment before his opaque glasses and a look away hide that more intense look. Tani reveals that the Go Club had some stones stolen and a card left behind, the third example revealed to the audience, though we only know what was on the card left for Kaho. As Satoshi goes to leave, Tani insists on finishing this one-sided competition, with Satoshi begrudgingly telling him that he'll be at the cooking show tomorrow. As Tani leaves, Satoshi watches him go, saying, <laughs>
which is an interesting turn of phrase. Satoshi with this is suggesting that competition against someone who isn't really interested is uncouth. This is important because it serves as Satoshi's baseline for the start of the arc. He's entering competitions not to win, but to have fun and promote Hyoka, as shown when he finishes promoting the anthology. He says he'd be okay losing at that point. People who are overly competitive show a lack of maturity. And speaking of lack of maturity, Satoshi throws his thoughts to Hotaro, wondering if he's doing his job, which he isn't. Instead, looking at photos of Chitanda that were taken in the previous episode. Curiosity ain't limited to just one character, and it causes him some panic as another customer walks in, causing him to scramble. As he sells another anthology, the trading adventure is continued, trading a safety pin for a water gun Glock. But we don't stick around there for long, returning to manga society, where again, the small details rock. Kochi baits Mayaka into an argument about the value of reviewing manga, which becomes a larger discussion of intrinsic value of a work. The president takes this moment to run outside with some paper, taking advantage of the debate to get some more people in the door. Though we, like Mayaka, are so focused on the argument, we don't see them until the discussion is over. The camera holds the 180 degree rule firm until the argument is over to make sure we don't see the observers. It's a nice unification of viewer and focal character. And while there's a lot of great stuff here in hindsight, the discussion reveals plenty as well. Like that Mayaka and Kochi clearly disagree about plenty when it comes to the club. As Mayaka represents, at least to some of the other club members, opposition to the types of things that Kochi wants to do. The argument is centered on the idea idea that Kochi states, This wide shot highlights the divide between the two of them and their supporters and the club. Kochi's argument is that it all depends on the reader. The reader alone determines whether a work is good or not. Mayaka fundamentally disagrees with the idea that there's no intrinsic difference in quality or value between manga series, as she crosses the threshold into Kochi's turf to argue face to face. Mayaka has Kochi define a masterpiece under her own schema. Something that is able to survive the ravages of time is a masterpiece. Mayaka counters that a masterpiece is born a masterpiece. There is no temporal aspect to intrinsic quality. When something of immense quality hits you, you just feel it. Mayaka uses as her example a manga that was sold at the culture festival last year, A Corpse by Evening, and asks if Kochi has read it. Kochi's reaction obviously implies that she has, but no one else in the club has, and so she denies it. Mayaka says that she'll bring it in for Kochi to read tomorrow, and thus ends the discussion. I love me a good debate about value of narrative, and so do plenty of others, as the president drew a quick sign highlighting what was going on inside resulting in a few extra bodies in the space. When Chitanda asks about the sign, the president states that it will be happening tomorrow, which maybe alludes to the fact that this was a plan between Kochi and the president that Mayaka got suckered into. But it could also just be a really good read on her part that the two will butt heads again tomorrow. Spoiler alert, we find out later that it's 100% the latter. With a cut to the sun setting, we rejoin the Classics Club who are debriefing the day in the club room. Satoshi viewed the day as a big success, Chitanda didn't have nearly as much luck, and Mayaka is still very clearly peeved by her argument from earlier. Chitanda's guilt over the amount of work still needing to be done makes her hold back on asking about the mystery she encountered earlier with Kaho. The energetic three make plans to join the cooking competition together, and as the bell rings to end the day, we cut to Mayaka searching her room top to bottom, trying to find her copy of a corpse by evening. Try as she might though, she is unable to locate it, sitting on her bed wondering where it could be as we zoom out to show how needle in a haystack this escapade really is. Episode 14 starts us off right with manga society the next day, the sun creating a dramatically illuminated scene as faction heads face off once more. Mayaka apologizes for being unable to find the manga as Kochi's faction stares at her. Notably, they're all wearing the same outfits while Mayaka and Kochi have mixed theirs up for day two. Presumably, this tells us who actually gives a crap about manga. Kochi doesn't really seem to care about the manga not being there, certainly not making a fuss out of it, and heading out for the day. While the lighting gave the impression of a showdown and the shot selection with the stares from Kochi's faction doubled down, Yoka subverts R and Mayaka's expectation for how we imagined that scene was going to play out. Mayaka and her friends even look surprised. After the OP, we establish that the cooking contest is happening later today before everyone returns to their respective plot threads. Satoshi finding out that the stolen ghost stones aren't a single event as Tanabe explicitly reveals for the audience that the acapella club was also a victim. A sparkle shines in Satoshi's eye before joining Chitanda talking with the Empress in front of everyone's favorite Kyoto Annie bad student film. 
Irisu agrees to help out, prompting a tearful reaction from Chitanda. And in classic Irisu fashion, instead of dealing with that emotion, just jumps straight into decisive action mode, telling Chitanda what she needs her to do for this agreement to work out. Chitanda, remembering that Irisu is extremely good at getting people to do things, her tarot nickname exists after all, uses her own extremely effective ability at getting people to help, to have Irisu give her a few pointers. And Irisu's suggestion is for Chitanda to utilize expectations. Irisu suggests that if someone believes that Chitanda has expectations of them, they'll do as she asks. She also gives the other practical advice of asking members of the opposite sex in private places, which always gets a chuckle out of me. Before we leave this scene, the ending shot I like quite a bit. It shows Chitanda and Irisu in opposite directions. As we've previously established, they're pretty different people in outlook and style. But Chitanda, taking this advice to heart, turns and lines up with Irisu almost perfectly. As we cut away, we get some nice foreshadowing with the cooking club counting their ladles, rejoining Hotoro from his sky-high position, as the trading adventure continues, trading flour for the water gun Glock, which the two pumpkin-wearing girls will use to scare passers-by for a very literal trick or treat. Maka is drawing away for Manga Society, as we cut to the start of the cooking competition. Wildfire is a real treat, but not one that's jam-packed with the kind of stuff I tend to analyze in Hyoka. And thus, I would recommend just watching it. But it's got solid moments of comedy with Chitanda and Satoshi trying to silently communicate with one another. Satoshi's face after Chitanda uses all of the ingredients is priceless at literally everything regarding the astronomy club. It has some great visual moments, match cut from Mayaka to Satoshi to convey both of their focus and their respective tasks. Mayaka's run across the schoolyard does a great job of building excitement for her to arrive. Fantastic sound design, not only in the OST that plays during each of the sequences. Particular shout out to the music used to build tension as Mayaka wonders what to cook with no ingredients, but also in how Hotoro's shouting is audible slightly even under the announcement and Mayaka's thought process. Also, as he shouts Satoshi's name, the number of people who think he's calling out to them is a laugh in and of itself. With the flour given to get Mayaka an ingredient to make an actual dish, her intense tap into pickup is so epic with the glare from the sun in the slow-mo, and we get immediate release in the tension with the team excitedly celebrating finishing on time. Mayaka gets a huge smile on her face from Satoshi's praise, and and Satoshi, in my personal opinion, shows that he has feelings for her for the first time in this moment, as he blushes and smiles so widely that not only did she show up like she promised, but her ability to persevere and pull off a great dish are exemplary of why he likes her. And Chitanda gives Hotoro his bit of credit as well, with a quick smile to herself, maybe remembering that the Hotoro of episode 1 would have considered yelling to Satoshi too much work. They win, too, which is a reminder that when the Classics Club is working together and firing on all cylinders, they're unbeatable. But disregarding all of that, Wildfire provides an important structural moment, as it's our halfway point for the arc and, not coincidentally, where our characters' motives all reconvene. It's the check-in halfway to see where everyone is in their festival character arc and where they're going from here now that they're all on the same track, as opposed to when Mayaka was off doing her own thing with Manga Society. It feels pseudo-climactic, with Hotoro's flower being given away with no obvious trade and winning the event, presumably increasing the Classics Club's name value. Of course, it isn't, since the end of the episode re-establishes the focal point for the second half of the Jumoji mystery as denoted by the name that has now appeared on this card as well. But with everyone gathered, even if it's just for a moment, the audience is able to take stock of where everyone is so far. Satoshi's been entering events for fun and to promote the Classics Club, but has a gleam in his eye about the mystery. Chitanda got some advice on how to use expectations to get people to do things for her, and Mayaka is in the middle of an argument with her upperclassmen about the intrinsic value of manga. And this reassessment bleeds its way into the start of episode 15, as it reasserts the two overarching goals selling all of the copies of Hyoka and the Jumoji mystery, to which Hotoro attempts to use the former to prevent investigation into the latter. Chitanda's curiosity getting in the way of what Hotoro wants to do is perfectly encapsulated in this shot. And despite his best efforts, Satoshi thwarts them by suggesting that solving Jumoji could get them more sales. In another amazing Satoshi moment, his plan revolves around Hotoro solving the case and promoting his previous Sekitani Jun exploit to sell Hyoka. Hotoro, unsurprisingly, is not thrilled by the idea of being made into a master detective. He's still a little bit hung up about the movie mystery, after all. And he points out the high improbability of anyone being able to solve the case purely based on the numbers. This inability to catch the thief is represented by the hand reaching into darkness and finding nothing. Hotoro's strong denial depresses the rest of the cast, though. And so, subtly, he begins to inquire, only asking what clubs have been targeted thus far. This should serve as a reminder that Hotoro has changed since the beginning of the show. Imagine him doing this in episode 2. 
He and Satoshi quickly establish that the targets are following the hiragana alphabet, and the team figures out the rest of the pattern, which points to the Classics Club being the final target. With all of that figured out, the team begins to go back to their separate ways. Chitanda runs off to talk with the Wall Newspaper Club again, with a story under her belt and some tips she picked up from Irisu, and Satoshi is going to continue the investigation into Jumoji. But as he does so, he has another one of his turns through Shadow. Last time we saw one of these is when he was biking away in the movie arc, and then it was about his jealousy as Hotaro's deductive genius was clear and his own was lacking. This moment is the same. Satoshi wants to solve the mystery on his own, and the turn through Shadow is the acknowledgement that he's jealous of Hotaro, and that's part of the reason why he's interested in investigating. Mayaka is eventually going to head back to manga society and gets really mad when she takes Hotaro's mm-hmm as some kind of affront. But we can attribute that mainly to her emotional state regarding her manga argument, as opposed to her relationship with Hotaro being rocky, though certainly that's at play as well. Jijanda arrives at the Wall Newspaper Club and attempts to put the things she learned into practice. But her stating expectations of Togaito isn't effective and seemingly neither is simply giving the info she's acquired in terms of getting confirmation that the Classics Club will be included in the article that they're going to publish. Satoshi isn't too worried about this development though, since he's planning on catching the thief himself, heading off to the Magic Club to catch them in the act. Chitanda points out that if the thief is caught before getting to the Classics Club, then they won't get the exposure they need which Satoshi brushes off, saying that he'll deal with it after he's caught them. While waiting for the Magic Club show to start, Tani reappears, something Satoshi is clearly enthused about. Tani is a lot like Satoshi, though, speaking excitedly about the mystery and the challenge, though a decent amount of that comes from the idea of being written about, as shown when he talks about the Walled Newspaper Club. Hell, he's a self-declared fan of mystery, something Satoshi is described as by Mayaka in the movie mystery arc. Returning back to Hotaro's musings, he starts thinking more about the motive, or meaning behind the thefts. What is Jumoji trying to get out of these actions? He admits that it's possible that the motive is just for fun, but if he can figure out the reasoning, that'd be one of the best ways to find the culprit. This is a bit of Chitanda's style of inquisitiveness rubbing off on Hotaro. He's thinking about the person behind the action, instead of just putting the actions together to make a theory. Mayaka asks if Hotaro wants to catch Jumoji. He doesn't. Then why is he getting into it? So why doesn't he ignore her? We've known this for a long while, even as far back as episode 1, frankly. But it's nice to hear Hotaro personally acknowledge it, even if he hasn't realized why that's the case just yet. Mayaka's laugh is likely a knowing one her having recognized the why. And fortunately, the trading adventure doesn't stop with the flower, with Hotaro gaining a mirror, albeit thrown at his face for calling Mayaka's outfit cosplay. We join Satoshi in the magic club room, which is dark as they wait for the show to start, though some excellent camera work almost guarantees that if you're paying close attention, you'll see that Jumoji's already struck. This shot has the girl on the left move, so you're likely to be paying attention there. If so, your eyes are probably already in the right spot to notice the missing candle. It's not a perfect alignment by any means, so Kyoka expects your eyes to move to the right to catch Tani. But Tani's movement is to the left, and his hair even flicks upwards, encouraging you to move in both of those directions. Of course, the backgrounds are dark, and it's a tough thing to spot unless you're looking for it. But for those with sharp eyes, Kyoka again makes the answer already apparent. Irisu walks in, and Satoshi asks if she likes magic tricks. She responds, I don't know enough to say that I like them, before looking at the stage somewhat excitedly. This is a side of Irisu we frankly haven't seen before in Hyoka, though somewhat alluded to in the movie mystery. She's not always the decisive empress. Sometimes she's just a normal high schooler who doesn't know everything. It's a small moment, one that makes Satoshi consider that she could possibly be Jumoji, even if it's just for a second, even though he doesn't think either Tanabe or Muneyoshi could be when they walk in moments later. But of course, as we saw with the missing candle, the thief didn't wait for the show to strike, rather taking it before the show. Satoshi ignored the pattern that we saw even with the cooking challenge, and is frustrated with himself wondering why he even went to the show. This shot as he's left to stew in his anger isolates him from everyone else enjoying the show and leaving him partially in shadow. We return to manga society, where without the influence of the president or Kochi, the cosplay girls openly insult Mayaka, and maybe more offensively to her, insult a corpse by evening. 
As another fight is about to break out, Kochi returns and shuts up her pack, though the daggers are still hyper apparent. Mayaka retreats to the Skyway, where she spots Satoshi and begins to call out to him before she stops herself, chiding herself for supposedly running away to him. Before she can let the tears flow though, the president arrives to check up on her. She says to Mayaka that Kochi isn't being serious. She can tell. They're friends after all. The president also confirms that Kochi is aware about a corpse by evening since one of her friends wrote it. Someone else did the art, but the author has since transferred out of the school. And even though Mayaka pushes to find out more about Kochi's true feelings, the president is not willing to say, indeed, because they're friends. Hotaro, still wearing his bruise, is packing up for the day as Satoshi arrives to recap the last few hours. As Satoshi explains what happened at the Magic Club, Hotaro reminds him and the audience that it's in the Classics Club's best interest for Jumoji not to get caught until afterwards. Satoshi tells Hotaro that he was waiting for Jumoji to strike during the show, and Hotaro points out that Jumoji struck before the event for the Cooking Club. And when Satoshi gets peeved that Hotaro didn't mention it to him, Hotaro points out that he didn't know what Satoshi's plan was, and thus couldn't have informed him that waiting at the Magic Club was a waste of time. As the rest of the team assembles, Hotaro recognizing that Chitanda looks pretty tired and Mayaka demoralized from her rough day, the club still has 137 copies to sell with only one day left to go. Which is met with some disbelief from Mayaka, with her making an internal realization that she's not helping out much on this end, and she's having a right miserable time over at Manga Society. The last two shots highlight this, with Mayaka isolated from the rest of the group, and then from her POV with all of them looking at her somewhat concerned, with all of the copies still on the table. That night with everyone back home, we affirm Hotro's concern about Chitanda, with her explicitly stating that she's tired. Keep in mind that this is the boundless energy Chitanda, so clearly something is up. Mayaka is trying to find another manga that is on the level of a corpse by evening, finding one called Body Talk, but saying that it's one level below it, but that her work is a hundred levels below even Body Talk. And Satoshi goes for a night walk. His internal thoughts begin with Hotaro, how he's changed and is still changing thanks to Chitanda. Satoshi acknowledges that he's jealous of Hotaro's ability to find answers, and that even though Hotaro's ability is a good thing and part of Satoshi is happy about it, that doesn't mean that he can't also be envious of it as well, and want to prove that he also has what it takes. Satoshi looks at the fact that there's over 1,000 suspects and concludes that it's not humanly possible to simply deduce that someone would have to catch the thief in the act. Otaro. Satoshi is unequivocally stating his intention to compete with Hotaro here, and it's a change from how he started the arc. He's now competing with someone who has no desire to compete, a la Tani and Satoshi, and is doing so in hopes of proving himself, as opposed to do it for fun or to promote their club, as his actions, if successful, will directly hinder the club's ability to sell the copies. This is consistent with his desires, but it's not consistent with his past insistence that he is just a database, and his earlier attitude of having fun in the competitions. He's got skin in the game now, his sense of self. And of course, his hand reaching out to the moon is a direct reference to Hotaro's visualization of catching Jumoji. The unknowing half of our competition is again on the KanyaFest website, noticing that the school is selling stuff online, before yawning to highlight this complete difference in focus between him and his opponent. Day 3 features the return of Tomoe, who takes a look at the Wall Newspaper Club's bulletin and immediately is able to put together the mystery in its entirety. And we'll come back to the proper chronological start with Satoshi in a moment, but I just really need to talk about Tomoe here. I think a decent number of people would make the assumption that Tomoe already had a corpse by evening in her bag. Both her normal bag and her plastic bag are in both shots, and it doesn't seem like a significant amount of time has passed. This assumes that Tomoe has a level of foresight and genius that is frankly unfair to attribute to her. She is smarter than Hotaro but not to Batman levels of prediction. I can state with 99% certainty that Tomoe went home and came back with a corpse by evening. And here's why. We go from Satoshi looking at his clock at 7am to Tomoe looking at the board. Afterwards, we cut to Hotaro sitting there getting ready for the day and beginning to think through the incident to try and put something together as to sell more copies. We then return to Satoshi, who updates the time to 10 a.m. But the most obvious piece of evidence is that Chitanda, who was in the same location as Tomoe, came to pick up more copies of Hyoka, which are there in the initial cut to Hotaro, and afterwards, some elderly woman chatted him up. Context clues suggest this took a while. He sold seven additional copies before Tomoe showed up. 
and we know the Oreki residence is in walking range of the school because Hotaro walks it. So everyone who thinks Tomoe is some kind of super genius who realized that the pen would get traded up and was already prepared with a corpse by evening can take a deep freaking breath. Speaking of the trading adventure, we reach our final stop here, as Tomoe trades the mirror for, wouldn't you know it, a corpse by evening. And we know Tomoe didn't predict the trading sequence because she asks for clarification that Hotaro traded the pen up for new stuff. Tomoe was joking with her brother by giving him the pen, and the Classics Club got lucky that it worked out like that. No one can convince me otherwise. If anything, Tomoe's superpower is for her to get extremely lucky despite her carefree attitude. See her travels abroad. Okay. Enough about Tomoe. Now that the trading sequence is done, I want to briefly talk about the value it brought to the narrative. At its core, it keeps Hotaro involved. While all of the other characters have B-plots that they're actively engaged in, aka that they're acting upon, Hotaro without the trading sequence would have no reason to be shown except for when something relevant to the mystery or selling goal was happening. And slow sales that don't forward something else don't provide anything of value for the audience to jump onto. And if every sale was accompanied by an obvious mystery development, it would ruin the controlled flow of types of information. So by having the trading plot where Punk Guy can bring in subtle relevant hints for the mystery, and Gardening Club can provide later foreshadowing, we can also have the Pumpkin Girls, who don't add to the mystery but still further the B-plot. It's just good freaking writing. And this is the perfect place to end the plotline, since from this point on Hotaro resumes his duties as main character. But before that, let's just jump back a bit to talk about Satoshi, who starts his day with a big smile on his face, though that smile quickly disappears as Tani, Haba, and a few other faces appear, also lying in wait for Jumoji. As the three hours pass between his arrival and the decisive moment, the faint of heart drop out, though their dropout is well-timed since Tani receives a message that Jumoji hit the light music club, skipping the Ku letter. Satoshi is shocked, and in a nice reversal is the one who presses Tani for info. Again, he's emotionally involved now. He can't act removed or above it anymore. Though Tani is not polite to Satoshi about it, shoving him aside. Satoshi realizes that he can't catch Jumoji in the act, and heads back to rejoin Hotaro in the Classics Club. After Tomoe leaves, Hotaro cracks open a cold one, and of course naturally begins by reading the afterword. The afterword reveals that there are three people involved, and that they were planning another work for the currently running Kanye Fest, and that it was going to be a mystery based off of an Agatha Christie work. Chitanda returns to the Classics Club to see Satoshi and Hotaro, who are sitting on opposite sides of the table. Chitanda doesn't get a chance to inform them that she'll be on the broadcast later to talk about Jumoji and promote the club before Hotaro finishes the manga and says, <sighs> Chitanda doesn't seem to care about the manga so much as the art, which she recognizes from the poster outside the executive committee room. And who else is interested in not only the manga, but who drew it? Mayaka, who we cut to inside the manga society working on posters. The faction war boils to a pitch when a girl intentionally spills a few dirty water drops onto Mayaka before accidentally dumping the whole thing onto her outfit. There's some great slow motion that sells how big of a deal this is in terms of the club. Mayaka isn't loved by that faction but certainly no one wanted this. And the reaction shots make it clear that this was a bridge too far, and Mayaka uses it as an excuse to get out of there for the rest of the day. The silent walk as everyone stares, including the customers, I think emotionally captures how hard Mayaka is trying to not make a scene. The show rewards her for this though, by having Chitanda appear and having the two set out to find the artist behind the manga and the poster, and giving Mayaka a chance to show a corpse by evening later on. Tanabe confirms that Kugayama, our student council president, drew the poster. Hotaro doesn't know who that is though, so this great shot where we can see both Kugayama and the Classics Club in the guide is some great foreshadowing for how Hotaro eventually strings together the answer to the mystery. Hotaro also struggles with reading the names, both in the case of Kugayama and in the authors of the manga, despite the fact that the romanization is literally on the front cover more proof that he needs the rest of the club to make sure he's on the right path. And on the right path he is, as he attempts to get Satoshi outside the club room to talk about the mystery, but wanting to avoid Chitanda since she wouldn't be down for whatever his plan is. The resulting scene where Chitanda is really upset, plastered in shadow, immediately lighting up as Hotaro says that it's an adult topic with this stunned face and tons of light coming in the window from behind Hotaro to create a visually striking shot honestly kills me. Especially because it's a lie. It's one of the few examples in the show of Hotaro denying Chitanda's curiosity. But unlike the Silk Spider mystery where he subverted it for his own reasons, this denial is technically for her own sake. 
Selling all of the copies of Hyoka is the main goal for the festival, after all. The mystery, as far as Hotoro is concerned, is just a means to arrive there. It's also important thematically that Hotoro only tells Satoshi his thoughts thus far. Satoshi is considering Jumoji a competition, after all. With Mayaka and Chitanda there, there wouldn't be this personal affair at play. And so with the two on the Skyway, Satoshi presumptively asks whether Hotoro found a connection between the clubs or if Jumoji had made a mistake. Hotoro says no to both, and Satoshi's mood changes almost instantly from happy and laid back to intense and competitive. He asks if Hotoro is going to find the culprit without either of those two things, and this amazing moment happens. <laughs> no soundtrack, just ambient noise from the festival and both of their reactions. The lighting went from bright and sunny to dark on their faces. Satoshi's mask is off entirely, every negative emotion viewable on his face for a brief moment. His envy, his frustration, his wrath. But he realizes it and slinks back, putting back on his mask moments later. It's frankly impossible to not draw a comparison between Satoshi and Tani and Hotoro and Satoshi. Just like Satoshi had no interest in competing with Tani, the same is true here for Hotoro. Tani was trying to compete for some kind of self-satisfaction. That's exactly what Satoshi is doing now, trying to prove himself against an opponent who's focused on something bigger than just themselves. Of course, we as an audience don't begrudge Satoshi for this, because we care about him and realize where he's coming from. Hell, we've already seen a very similar sequence where Satoshi was extremely frustrated with Hotoro during the movie Mystery Arc. It's the same location and similar lighting features are used there as well. Though the reasons for his frustrations are almost exactly opposites. And while Hotoro probably doesn't realize why that happened, he's a good enough friend not to push it, and instead lets the mask go back on as he begins to outline his thoughts. When Hotoro finishes his thoughts, Satoshi kind of just stares at him with a slight frown before saying that he's heading back. And when he reaches inside, he looks back at Hotoro and says, Satoshi in shadow, Hotoro in light. It's the visualization of Satoshi's desire to be able to find the answers in impossible circumstances, and his realization that he'll never reach Hotoro's level. The final episode in the arc kicks off with Ice Climber's main Chitanda on the broadcast. We cut through the Classics Club while she makes an impassioned plea, filled with expectations of everyone in the school to assist them. Hotoro walking with an empty bag, Satoshi standing in partial shadow, melancholy at best, Mayaka realizing that a few more copies have disappeared. Irisu listening to the broadcast looking displeased while purchasing some cute stuffed animals, just showing more of the Empress's dichotomy that we talked about earlier. As they go off the air, Chitanda gives a tired sigh, wondering if the way that she asked, as suggested by Irisu, was the right thing to do for her personally. Whether this style of stating expectations of other is ideal for the type of person she is. Though she certainly makes some direct appeals more in line with her straightforward nature, albeit asking people to just buy the anthology. But regardless of how Chitanda feels in that moment, it definitely works. As the Classics Club room is packed to the brim and selling copies of Hyoka left, right, and center. Mayaka's little poster, by the way, is one of my favorite things in the world and I want one. But people are getting impatient as heard in the dialogue and shown in the shot composition. Quick pans and cuts to people's waiting ticks. What I love about this sequence is that Jumoji is kind of obvious if you're going through frame by frame, or on rewatch. But the scene is designed to pull you away from him. Since as the phone rings, everyone looks to it, guiding your eyes there. We pull focus from the phone to our three guards who conveniently block the shot. And of course, the explosion is so energetic that who has time to look in the background? Everyone's frustration is clear. They all want to catch Jumoji, except for Hotoro, who only appears from behind Chitanda in this pan. He's gone behind her back, after all. Satoshi looks at Hotoro knowingly as we cut to the end of the day, where everything is getting torn down. Irisu gives Chitanda the money from selling all their copies of Hyoka. Chitanda thanks Irisu, and then Irisu takes back her advice from earlier about using expectations. Quote, and then if it were to continue, that dependency might become Chitanda's reality. Irisu is suggesting here that people who have expectations of other aren't just stating something about the other person, they're also stating something about themselves. 
Irisu adds that Chitanda's straightforward nature is a weakness, but also a strength. To me, this says a lot about Irisu, and why I've asserted in the past this question about which version of her is the facade. She's someone who uses expectations of people and more duplicitous methods, which in turn have changed the person she is. What if the meaning of Irisu's tarot card, the Empress, speaks not to the face, which is a decisive ruler, but instead to the underlying meanings, affection and sensitivity? I think here, when she says that pretending can become your reality, that's exactly what happened to her. The girl who liked stuffed animals and is a normal high schooler who genuinely cares about her underclassmen is replaced when she has expectations of people to do things for her. And to be clear, I'm not saying that other people have expectations of Irisu. Clearly, she doesn't care about that, as shown in the magic show, when Satoshi pointedly says it's unexpected for her not to have made up her mind about magic shows. I don't think either of these is the true Irisu, to be clear. They're both aspects of her. She can use Hotoro and break him in one moment, but be very conscious of her treatment of Chitanda in another, because the circumstances are different, and what she expects from them is different. And when we run into Irisu again, we'll see more of that. But for now, Chitanda agrees with her assessment, saying that she didn't think she was cut out for it, and that not being straightforward makes her tired. That is to say, being fake is hard for Chitanda and why she and Hotoro match up so perfectly. Our last scene with Tani comes next, with him stating that he had expectations of Satoshi, who responds, <laughs> As Tani leaves, Mayaka asks who that was, which is perfect. Because Satoshi and Tani aren't friends, they're barely even acquaintances. Satoshi thinks to himself about the word expectations, and as Mayaka tries to say that it's not a big deal, <laughs> Further saying that expectations are what you have once you've given up. Unless you've already given up, it sounds fake. This is another interpretation of expectations. Again, focused on the person wielding the expectations, as opposed to the person who has them placed upon them. Satoshi's line of thinking for expectations is akin to how he expects Hotoro to bring them answers. He is relying on Hotoro to succeed, because he knows that he cannot. It's why he was so upset in the movie mystery arc. Hotoro failed them, and why he's been so melancholic now. With Hotoro solving the mystery, as we're about to see, forcing Satoshi to accept yet again that he just doesn't have the talent for it. Satoshi's role as the database is him saying that he has no confidence in his ability to make a deduction. That's why he places his expectations on Hotoro. And that goes all the way back to episode four. And Hotoro exceeds his expectations in the festival arc with one of my absolute favorite deductions in the entire show. Hotoro goes through his final deduction with Jumoji, better known as Tanabe, head of the executive committee. This is a showdown between detective and suspect battling theories and arguments in an attempt to capture and close in on the other. If we were set in the Old West, we'd call this a duel. The corridor is designed to only allow movement forward or backward. There's no lateral escape, either you press forward or you concede the space. And while this isn't the high point of Hotoro's deductive reasoning in the show, it is certainly the most dramatic. Hotoro knowing that Kugayama Muneyoshi was the artist for A Corpse by Evening, thanks to Chitanda and Mayaka's investigation, and that there was no follow-up manga by the team being sold at the festival. He figured out that the variation on the ABC murders that was supposed to be the basis for that manga was a message here, in this case, for Kugayama. The list of targets wasn't randomly based on letter, it was based on the last page of the club listings, of which Kugayama's name was on. The final sequence in the deduction, where Hotoro narrows the possible targets down. Who had enough knowledge to pull this off, who had a desire to convey this message, and who has the first letters in Tanabe's name, all occur as the camera pans across the scene slowly at first, but then faster and faster and zooming closer and closer as Hotoro builds to his conclusion, as the duel reaches its finishing point with the final spectacular reveal. Satoshi, who's listening in, can only say that Hotoro exceeded his expectations 
again, his eyes in shadow, accepting his defeat. If Chitanda were here, she'd be wondering the why. Hotro put together the answer by thinking about what the message might be, which is the first proper step in thinking like Chitanda would about the person. But even then, he couldn't figure out why Tanabe wanted to send it this way. Tanabe says that he couldn't tell Kugayama directly, in this great two-shot where one is of just his mouth and the other cuts it out of the frame, alluding to his alternate meaning of conveying the idea. And the thing I like most about this deduction is that it was just a means to an end for Hotoro, using his knowledge of Jumoji to get Tanabe's help in selling the rest of the copies of Hyoka. Hotoro makes Tanabe an offer he really can't refuse between helping end the incident, having more stuff to sell on the website, and doing a solid for his underclassmen. Tanabe asks what Hotoro's name is, as Hotoro, who had no personal knowledge of Tanabe, was able to figure out, whereas our match cut to Satoshi, who does know Tanabe, was not. With the flashback done, we return to Mayaka, asking if Satoshi is talking about himself and Hotoro. When asked how she knew, she simply says she knows him well enough, which to me reflects back to the Manga Society president talking about Kochi, where Mayaka wasn't able to accept that then, but inherently knows when it comes to her and her friends. At this moment, track 20 comes on. I refer to it as Toy Box Soliloquy because it takes the melodic leitmotif of the silent scream, also known as track 43, which is indicative of the Hyoka moment. And this is a bit of the Hyoka moment, but here, the scream is being stated. Maika asks if he wanted to beat Hotoro. Satoshi takes a moment and says that he didn't want to win. That's not to say that he didn't want to catch Jumoji, but rather to say that he didn't desire direct competition with Hotoro to prove himself better. As he says in the next line, when you're always looking up, which implies that he just wanted to get to Hotoro's level. He didn't want to win, he would have been happy with a tie or being more instrumental in Hotoro's deduction instead of just being his helper for Jumoji's attack on the Classics Club. And I don't think Satoshi is lying here. I believe that he wanted to win, otherwise why would he have said what he did on the night walk, but I don't think he would have assumed that he was better than Hotoro just based off of that. I think it would have just given him faith that he could have been a Sherlockian. But Satoshi says that Mayako wouldn't understand, because he also places her on a pedestal above him, as he did on the walk to school in the movie arc, where he suggested that Mayako would become a better Sherlockian than him in one month if she wanted to. Mayako knows that that's crap, from her own frustrations with her manga and holding Satoshi in such high regard. I love how this scene builds space between them and how they're framed, from top to hand to bottom. As Satoshi sadly says his catchphrase, Mayaka closes the gap and grabs his shirt. She's offering both emotional support and needing it for herself, as she outlined earlier about running away to him. These are characters that need each other in this moment. Mayaka for the strength for what she's about to do, and Satoshi for someone who can understand him a little bit in this moment. The smile on his face as he turns to her, I think recognizing this kindness, even if he hasn't realized how wrong he is about Mayaka's talent. What Irisu said about expectations applies here as well. If you pretend long enough, it can become your reality. And to quote a certain volleyball manga, if you think to yourself you don't have the talent, then you'll probably never have it. After the brief aside in which we find that Kugayama realized that Tanabe was indeed Jumoji, but having nothing to say regarding the message, we had to join Mayaka for the ending of the value of manga plotline. We return to the Skyway, where Mayaka initially had her discussion with the president about this very topic. As Kochi reveals indeed that she's aware of a corpse by evening, Mayaka lays out her final argument, where she represents Kochi's argument as whether something is interesting or not is a matter of how you look at it, but if that were true, that would make everything pointless. Specifically, the everything there is referring to the idea of improving and practicing. If there is no objective standard, no such thing as intrinsic value, then the least talented are just as skilled as the best of the best, and anyone could have an equal chance at producing a masterpiece. And there's a reason why Kochi argued this. And it's because it's a kind of comforting belief that you could just get lucky. Kochi's return argument is that since it's impossible to quantify intrinsic value, the only people who can realize this are those who understand the difference between their preferences and something that's objectively great. Mayaka doesn't really bother responding to this. Even Hotoro, who is far from a frequent consumer of manga, finished A Corpse by Evening wholly impressed. Kochi now confirms what the manga president told us earlier, that she was joking. And of course she is. She's read Noragami. But the reason why she was joking, like stated before, was a comforting one. If you had a friend who didn't really read manga, and then they wrote one, and they wrote a masterpiece, 
what would you do? If you had read and written and worked insanely hard and they're just so naturally talented that they're able to produce something so incredible, what would you do? This isn't just Kochi and Haruna, this is Satoshi and Hotaro. Would you accept the difference between heaven and earth a la prodigy and bench player? Would you retreat to the belief that it's complete luck or chance akin to there are no masterpieces argument? Or would you deny it completely? and ignore the difference and trudge onward. Kochi would deny it and lie to herself. And even though this decision is implied to have ruined her friendship with Haruna, where they haven't spoken in a while, and she would rather not read it so that she doesn't have to call and ask to read the next one, this is Satoshi if he placed his desire for talent above his friendship with Hotaro. Kochi could never sit next to Haruna and watch her produce a masterpiece, but Satoshi, to his credit, can't and can appreciate what Hotaro is able to accomplish. Kochi walks away, leaving Mayaka behind with the doodle Kochi drew, found on the back of Body Talk, the manga that Mayaka considered showing instead, but considered one level below a corpse by evening. As Mayaka has two works in front of her that are far better than anything she's produced, she can't help but start crying, with a tear falling on the cat such that it's crying as well, giving us this fantastic trio of Haruna as the prodigy and Kochi on the bench, but for Mayaka who's on the bench, Kochi is the prodigy. Mayaka's had a rough couple of days, and for her to cry here feels really proper. She feels this sense of inadequacy, but realizes that even the people up the chain feel that way as well, like Hotaro did when he failed in the movie mystery, and as Kochi does now. It doesn't matter how far she goes to produce the masterpiece she wants to, she'll always have these feelings of inadequacy, and that is why Mayaka cries. Because she will not deny the reality that manga has intrinsic value, and thus cannot run away to the idea that there's no such thing as a born masterpiece. And she has been forced to acknowledge how massive the skill gap is, and how it does nothing but continue to raise oneself expectations. But as she said earlier, those beliefs would make everything pointless. And it's clear that Mayaka is going to keep striving forward, regardless of whether she's on the bench, or the prodigy. Back at the Classics Club, they only have four copies of Hyoka left. Mayaka's got some red eyes from crying, but looks satisfied that Satoshi is back to being himself, and in her conclusion about how much work she'll have to do to make it. Chitanda says that they did so much better than expected in selling the copies of the anthology, leading us to the final expectation. We flash back to Tanabe one more time, as the music that is indicative of our Hyoka moment begins to play. Hotaro didn't know the motive, and thus Tanabe says that the only other person who could understand his feelings is Haruna, which is to say that Jumoji was an attempt to convey his feelings to Kugayama. Kugayama hasn't picked up the pen since drawing a corpse by evening, and again we have another prodigy and bench player, now in the form of Tanabe and Kugayama. Hotaro thinks to himself that he can't imagine a corpse by evening being just for fun. It's too impressive and Tanabe vocalizes this by saying that it's a waste for him not to use it. Tanabe's had expectations of Kugayama to make a manga better than A Corpse by Evening, and thus the silent scream found in Jumoji's incident is Kugayama, Kugayama never once had, as he wasn't able to realize the message leaving Tanabe to bear the weight of his own expectations all alone. This is the silent scream that Tanabe is forced to swallow. Expectations are inevitable once you've noticed a skill gap. That kind of distance would cause one to give up after all. You can either accept this and have your expectations weigh on you, changing your understanding of self, or you can deny the skill gap, put it far in the back of your mind, and distance your relationship from the people whom you would place those expectations on to make sure that you never have to acknowledge it. The only choice, it would seem, is to not give up in the first place, to accept the difference in talent as Mayaka did and press on regardless. But that moment has passed for Tanabe. With everything kinda sorta wrapped up, Chitanda is able to finally unleash her curiosity, which Satoshi helps out with by telling her that Hotaro's figured it out. When Hotaro asks why he's doing this, Satoshi replies, you owe me this much, which is a direct reference to helping out with Jumoji, being the sounding board for the theory, and helping play keep away with Chitanda far earlier in the story. But I think Hotaro's confusion suggests that he doesn't see it that way, which could allude to the fact that Satoshi understands where he is in the Tanabe-Kugayama relationship, frankly the clearest comparison point for Satoshi and Hotaro. 
Satoshi can either follow Tanabe and weigh his expectations on someone who does not desire to use their talent, or he can follow Mayaka's lead and press forward regardless. This moment, I think, hints that Satoshi, at the very least, isn't going to follow Kochi's example. That he and Hotaro are going to remain friends regardless of what path he winds up taking. But regardless, as we zoom out of both of our classics club and the school gate getting torn down, we end with a final zoom back into the club room and the final total sold out. If the Sekitani Junark is the heart of Hyoka, focused primarily on Hotaro and Chitanda, with Hotaro's character growth and talent at the forefront, then the festival arc is the soul. Satoshi and Mayaka really get their due in these episodes, and the discussion about those who don't have insane talent and how those who hold expectations have a weight all of their own to carry is the type of beautiful introspection I expect from this series. Hotoro and Chitanda are the skilled. Hotoro has expectations of himself that we've talked about in the past, movie mystery is in part an exploration of self-set expectations, but this arc truly isn't about him. Chitanda can't have expectations of people because she'll never give up and she doesn't like putting burdens on people. But this arc isn't really about her either. She practically ends the arc the same way she started. Mayaka and Satoshi are the focus because they're normal people who actually change. Mayaka has shattered expectations for what it's like to be talented, a burden that she will now be free from though it stings at the moment. And Satoshi will have to accept the fact that he has given up and that the only person he's weighing down is himself, or he will have to change to no longer accept his self-expected role of the database and to keep trying even if it is ultimately worthless. And it might be. Hyoka doesn't pretend that everyone should just try their best and it will all work out. Maybe Mayaka and Satoshi will reach the place they dream of if they keep trying, but at the very least, it seems preferable to giving up and running away in the way that Tanabe and Kochi have. And this answer has been in front of us since the very beginning, signposted way back in episode 12. To quote Chitanda, And that's the beauty of the festival arc and why many consider this arc to be Hyoka at its core. It is both the high point of a rose-colored life, wildfire and selling all of the copies, with the bitter moments that come with it. It is unbridled joy and success accompanied by fundamental questions of self and what the future holds in store. Hotaro and Chitanda leave this arc without shedding tears, but while Mayaka and Satoshi do, it's not enough to ruin their festivals, as they leave with a smile and the promise of food and friends. And so as we put the final Hyoka arc behind us, we are left to consider the value of expectations and whether they, like everything else in Hyoka, can teach us something about the way we view ourselves interact with others, and how accepting them or denying them in favor of taking one more step can change us. Hey all, hope you enjoyed my master's thesis on Hyoka's festival arc. If you like this longer form of analysis or my Hyoka series, consider supporting me on Patreon so I can budget the time to make this kind of thing instead of making it over the course of three months. Let me know your thoughts down below, follow me on Twitter, and as always, thanks for watching.